Hey everybody, this is Mr. Moffin coming at you with another 8Push video. This is our second video on topic 5.9, looking at government policy during the Civil War. Uh, last time we looked at the uh, use of power by President Abraham Lincoln, uh, power used in uh, an unprecedented way for American presidents, and Lincoln's uh, evolving views on what the, the role of the war should be. Now, today we're going to take a look at some other key political components of the Civil War. And one of those effects is how the war is going to be affecting civilian life. Uh, we mentioned previously that one of the more controversial actions of Lincoln uh, during the war is to suspend habeas corpus, which is going to allow the, uh, the United States government to jail and detain people uh, without formal charges being brought. Uh, and take a look at how many will end up being jailed uh, in this way. 13,000 Americans are going to be jailed, many of them without any uh, formal charges brought, uh, just simply based on suspicion of aiding the Confederacy. So this is not a small amount. This is a large amount of people. Uh, something else that will be uh, you know, done by uh, Lincoln, the federal government, uh, is allowing the Union Army to engage in military-style tribunals for civilians that had been uh, charged with disloyalty, charged with treason. Uh, now, this is going to actually be appealed uh, in the case of Ex parte Milligan. And the Supreme Court is actually going to rule that uh, civilians cannot be tried in a military court unless civilian courts are not available. Uh, so that is significant because you know, even during a time of war, there should be protections for civilians. Civilians are not members of the active military. For those of you that are not uh, familiar, if you are active military, you do go through a separate military trial system if you are charged with crimes. And as a result of this particular ruling, ex parte Milligan, civilians cannot be a part of that military uh, judiciary process. Now, something else that is going to be new and extremely controversial uh, will be the creation of the Conscription Act. The Conscription Act is a military draft. It is now going to require uh, men to possibly be forced to serve in the Union Army. This gives you a sense of how many people have been killed and how many have been wounded in this conflict and how long this conflict is going on. It goes from being just a purely volunteer army to now a conscripted army. But note, there will be exceptions, uh, and this is going to create a lot of controversy. Uh, if you had $300, you could buy your way out of military service. Uh, $300 today would be, you know, close to about, you know, I don't know, close to about $10,000. Uh, and so... If you had some real money, you know, if you had some serious amounts of money, like, say, a John D. Rockefeller did at the time, you could buy your way out of military service, and some like Rockefeller did. Uh, you also could get out of military service, military service by uh, getting somebody to fill your spot. So you could maybe, you know, pay somebody, maybe not $300, but pay somebody to take your spot. Uh, you know, I know that's kind of a Hunger, Hunger Games kind of way of doing things, but that was also an exemption. Uh, but if you didn't have large amounts of money or even money to pay somebody else to take your spot, you are now going to be vulnerable to getting uh, drafted into the Union Army. And as more and more reports are coming back from battles such as, you know, Gettysburg and Antietam and places like that, these are horrifically high numbers. And so you are very fearful that you may go down to go fight in this war and may never come home alive. Uh, and so this is going to lead to some protests. Now, fueling these protests, once again, starting in 1863, is the reality that if you are fighting in this war, this is no longer simply a war to keep the Union together. There is now this aided uh, moral or added moral racial component that this is about uh, you know, abolishing the institution of slavery unto itself. And as we've said before, uh, you know, Northerners were racist, just like Southerners. And for many Northerners, the idea that they may have to be forced, conscripted, to go fight and die potentially to help black people uh, was abhorrent for many white Americans in the North. And so when you factor all these things together, matters of race and class and things like that, this is going to boil over in New York City into some really, really horrific 
uh, draft riots that are going to be uh, taking place here. You can see one depiction of these uh, draft riots. This is going to be taking place in lower to midtown uh, Manhattan. Uh, we are going to be uh, seeing uh, thousands of people get hurt. Uh, dozens of African Americans will be lynched uh, in these protests. You know, as we were saying, you know, there's this racist component to the protests of the Conscription Act. Uh, the idea being is, oh, it's black people that are going to send this off to go die for them. That's going to make black folks the target of, of these lynchings and just horrific violence. Uh, there will be millions of dollars of damage uh, to homes and things like that, businesses in, in lower Manhattan. So it's going to be pretty ugly, pretty violent uh, for sure. Uh, now, as the war is dragging on, Constitution says you still have to have elections as normal. And that then brings us to the election of 1864. Now, in 1864, Lincoln's going to be running for re-election, and his opponents, uh, his name, uh, quite, quite a memorable one, is going to be George McClellan. Now, if you don't remember George McClellan, George McClellan was the twice-hired, twice-fired uh, commander of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, Lincoln uh, became exasperated with McClellan out of a sense that McClellan was not willing to do what it took to aggressively attack Lee to try to end the war. Uh, in essence, Lincoln thought McClellan was a wimp. Uh, McClellan, conversely, uh, loathed Lincoln. You know, McClellan came from a wealthy, established family, uh, and Lincoln, you know, came from nothing. Uh, McClellan viewed Lincoln as this kind of you know, hayseed, savage, uh, you know, third-class kind of person that really wasn't uh, dignified enough to hold the position of being president of the United States. So this was not just a difference of opinions politically. On some level, this this was personal. Uh, and when we do take a look at you know some some of the finer details regarding the the election of 1864, uh, McClellan's going to be running on. Uh, what is going to be a peace platform. McClellan is going to represent what, you know, many uh, Democrats in border states, for you, if you will, are going to be championing. The idea being is that, you know, this war has gone on for so long. Hundreds of thousands of young men have died. What have we gotten out of it? Nothing. So if the southern states want out so bad, then let them out. Just let's make a peace deal. Let's get out. Uh, and note, you know, there were many in northern states that supported this idea. Uh, northerners that supported the idea of, you know, ending the war with a peace treaty and letting the South become independent, these folks were known as copperheads. And ladies and gentlemen, here in southern Ohio, this was a hotbed of copperhead activity. Uh, so McClellan is going to, you know, be popular in many of these border states, you know, areas near the Ohio River, the you know, Mason-Dixon line, places like that. And, and note, you know, McClellan's message is going to resonate to some degree. And, and Lincoln's concerned. Republicans are concerned. You know, the war has not been won. It is not over. Now, by the fall of 1864, things are looking in a good direction. Uh, you know, Sherman is making his way through Georgia. Uh, Grant is now starting to take on Lee in Virginia. But it's still not over. Uh, and so Lincoln and the Republicans feel that they kind of have to do something drastic to try to shore up their support. And so what Lincoln and the Republicans will do is, is, is pretty wild. They're going to create a coalition party, a one-time coalition party in 1864 known as the Union Party. And this Union Party ticket is going to have Lincoln at the top of the ticket as, as the nominee. But as the running mates, they will bring in a Democrat, a Southern Democrat by the name of Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was a senator from Tennessee and was the only member of uh, the Southern Confederate delegation in Congress to not join the Confederacy and stay in support of the Union. So Lincoln is trying to send the message that, hey, you know, this is a party ticket and a party platform about bringing the Union together, a Northern Republican, a Southern Democrat, working together on one platform, one ticket. Uh, and this will prove to be successful. As you take a look at the uh, Electoral College results right here, you're going to see 
that uh, you know Lincoln's going to uh, win by a, a pretty safe margin in the popular vote and will be a landslide in the Electoral College, winning over 90% of the Electoral College votes. You may note here in kind of the deeper brown, like, hey, where's the Electoral College vote totals down here? Remember, this is the Confederacy. So the Confederacy is not participating in Congress, and they are not voting in uh, U.S. elections because they don't consider themselves part of the United States at this time. So uh, Lincoln is going to you know, win a hard-fought uh, second term, and so that's going to give Lincoln... Uh, at least, you know, uh, some, uh, you know, some confidence that, hey, all right, he's now got four more years to bring this uh, Civil War to an end. Uh, now, another key part of the Lincoln presidency is his visit to the field of battle at Gettysburg a few months after the battle ends. Now, you may recall that Gettysburg was the most violent battle of the Civil War. Uh, tens of thousands of casualties over a three-day period. And following this horrific, deadliest battle of the war, Congress will vote to create a, uh, a national cemetery there to commemorate uh, you know, that, the loss, the, the, just the, the massive amount of loss from that battle. And so Lincoln goes to the ceremony to uh, dedicate this new cemetery that will be built. And at this occasion, Lincoln is going to deliver a speech. Uh, this speech, which eventually be known simply as the Gettysburg Address, is arguably the most famous speech of his life. And it's an unbelievably short, concise speech. Uh, in fact, I'm going to read it here real quick. Uh, he says, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are, uh, we are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our power, our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they, which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great, to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they have gave, for which they here they here gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. So when you look at this speech, it is focusing in on the importance of understanding the 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 rationale of why we are fighting that the reason so many have sacrificed their lives at this, not just this battle, but in the war itself, is to create something better than what we have now. Uh, a, a government that is going to be, uh, you know, open to all Americans, all people, that freedom will be expanded, that this is a war to really fully manifest some of the critical values of the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, not just white men, but all men are created equal. And so, you know, once again, the idea being is that if we do not bring this war to an end, and if we do not abolish slavery as an institution, the lives that have been lost at Gettysburg and throughout the war will have been pointless. It will have been in vain. So understand that this war has to be won by the Union. And it's not just for you know practical reasons, it's for moral reasons. Uh, and so, once again, this shows the significance of Lincoln as truly reflective and, and an amazing leader to provide guidance and clarity of vision during this dangerous and critical time in our history. All right, we'll leave it here for now. We'll see you next time.